The neuromuscular junction is basically the intersection between a muscle fiber and a nerve. Specifically, we're talking about this area shown there in the white box. If, we, if you can imagine zooming in on this area, this is what you would see. You would see the nerve terminal entering the muscular junction. And specifically, when we talk about this, we talk about things like a presynaptic and postsynaptic area. This is no different than any other neural connection, but it's neuromuscular because it connects a neuron to a muscle. Now, when you look at this diagram, the things that we're going to be focusing on today are labeled as 3 and 4. 3 is acetylcholine, and 4 is the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. So under normal circumstances, acetylcholine will flow out of the presynaptic nerve terminal and bind to its receptor on the postsynaptic membrane. We're going to simplify this today, but this is what this video is all about because this is the basis for all of the physiology that we're going to talk about. So if I simplify this drawing even more, this is what we're talking about. The presynaptic nerve terminal and the postsynaptic membrane. This is the neuromuscular junction. Now, under normal circumstances, you'll have a neurotransmitter, in this case acetylcholine, shown there as red circles. And the acetylcholine will leave the presynaptic nerve terminal and bind to its nicotinic acetylcholine receptor on the postsynaptic membrane, shown here as red diamonds. This is what happens normally. I'm just going through normal physiology. When these neurotransmitters bind to their receptors, you generate an action potential, which you see here, which travels down through the muscle and helps coordinate muscular contraction. This is very important for normal gait, normal muscular tone, etc. But what happens when this doesn't go as planned? So let's talk about an example. Instead of acetylcholine, shown as red circles, let's say that we give a drug, and the drug is going to bind to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor on the postsynaptic membrane. Shown here, the drug will be illustrated by light blue stars. These light blue stars mimic acetylcholine because they're going to bind to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. So it flows across and binds to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. When it does that, this particular drug, drug's job is to inhibit the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. So it does this by just occupying it. What happens when you do that is you get a fade in activity. So instead of generating a normal action potential, the activity at the receptor fades quickly over time and blocks all impulses. This is the mechanism of non-depolarizing neuromuscular blockers. I will talk about this more in depth as we go on, but I just want to kind of plant the seed now that a non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocker will bind to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor and cause a fade in activity without depolarizing the receptor. Now, what happens if we have a different substance shown here as yellow stars? I do apologize because I understand that the yellow is very bright and may be difficult for you to see, but there are yellow stars there. Now, these yellow stars are also a drug that are neuromuscular blockers, but they act differently. They flow across to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, and instead of blocking the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, they constantly stimulate it. And when they do that, they bind to the receptor and supercharge the postsynaptic membrane. And by doing that, they cause action potentials to fire over and over and over and over again. By doing this, they essentially tire out the postsynaptic membrane. And at first, they'll cause a diminished but constant action potential, but then that will quickly turn into a fading over time. This is the mechanism of a depolarizing neuromuscular blocker. So again, the difference between depolarizing and non-depolarizing is that the depolarizing neuromuscular blocker will depolarize and cause sustained action at the receptor, which is constant but diminished, and then that quickly progresses into a fading of activity as the receptor and the postsynaptic membrane get tired over time. So let's talk about the differences here because this is what's really high yield for step one and level one. Depolarizing neuromuscular blockers are, have two phases of action. The first phase is that constant phase. And these lines that you see in orange, this is how this will be shown to you when you take tests and exams. That basically, it's a snapshot of the action at the postsynaptic membrane. Phase one is the constant but diminished action. The receptor is firing. The postsynaptic membrane is undergoing action potentials and activity because it, it's being depolarized, hence the name depolarizing neuromuscular blocker. Over time, though, that action will fade and mimic what you see in a non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocker. So the non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocker only has one step, and it's that fade. The depolarizing has two phases, phase one, which is constant but diminished, and phase two, which is the fade. So phase two of depolarizing and 
the overall action of non-depolarizing are identical. They're both the fades. The only difference is that depolarizing has a constant but diminished phase one, where you get constant activity at the receptor. Depolarizing neuromuscular blockers, there's one that you need to know, and it's succinylcholine. Everything else is non-depolarizing, so they all end with curium. Curium is non-depolarizing, and succinylcholine is depolarizing. We'll talk about the mnemonic after this slide. Depolarizing has no antidote for that phase one. So phase one, where it's the constant but diminished activity at the receptor, there's no antidote to reverse that. But if, if someone overdoses, let's say, on a non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocker, you just give them an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor, and that is the antidote. So think about it. You're blocking acetylcholine activity. If you give them an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor, you're inhibiting the thing that usually breaks down acetylcholine. So basically, acetylcholine is disinhibited, and therefore total levels of acetylcholine are increased. That is why acetylcholine esterase inhibitors are the antidote for non-nepolarizing neuromuscular blockers. The super, super high yield thing on this slide, besides just those orange lines, is that if you give someone a depolarizing neuromuscular blocker, there are three things or three side effects you should look for. The first is fasciculations. Because that receptor is being constantly stimulated and depolarized, you're going to see this manifest as fasciculations or small twitches in the muscle. Again, the muscle is active. An action potential is generated. You are depolarizing the receptor. Because of this, we expect to see things like fasciculations and muscular activity. The really, really high yield one is hyperkalemia. And especially in patients who have profound tissue damage or are recent victims of something like a burn. Anytime you depolarize a muscular receptor, you cause activity at that receptor. Now, think about it this way. If you have muscles acting over and over and over again, the muscle breaks down and releases the, the, the intramuscular potassium that flows out into the rest of the body. This is basically the pathophysiology of something like rhabdomyolysis. So think about it the same way here. When you depolarize over and over and over again, you cause release of potassium. So in somebody who is has a lot of muscular injury, was recently burned, etc., look for hyperkalemia on tests. They might try to get you with that by showing you an EKG and asking you, you know, to to identify peaked peaked waves due to hyperkalemia. Um, maybe they'll give you a patient who goes into new onset kidney failure and they're hinting at rhabdomyolysis. There are lots of ways that they can get after hyperkalemia. So keep that in the back of your mind when someone gets something like succinylcholine, which is a depolarizing neuromuscular blocker. And finally, malignant hyperthermia. Anytime you give someone a depolarizing neuromuscular blocker, they are at risk for developing malignant hyperthermia. Understand how you treat it. Know about dantrolene, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So those are the main differences that you should keep in mind for your test. Depolarizing versus non-depolarizing. The mnemonic in the way that I remember this is that I say depolarizing sucks, and ND curium. So sucks for succinylcholine. It sucks because it can cause fasciculations, hyperkalemia, rhabdomyolysis, and malignant hyperthermia. Sucks reminds me of succinylcholine. And sucks reminds me that the depolarizing neuromuscular blocker just sucks all of the life out of the receptor by stimulating it for so long. ND curium, the ND obviously reminds me of non-depolarizing, and curium is obviously all of those agents end in curium. The other thing is that curium sounds like curious, and I find it curious that these, re that these agents don't stimulate any action at the receptor. In fact, they just cause that fade effect, which is very curious. So depolarizing agents sucks, and ND curium are curious agents that don't do anything. So those are the major, major differences and everything that you should keep in mind for test day. If you really are struggling with brain space, know the difference between the, the graph of the lines, so those orange lines at the top, know that depolarizing has two phases, and then know the side effects of the depolarizing agents such as hyperkalemia, malignant hyperthermia, and muscular fasciculations. Now let's talk about some things or some pathology that can occur when we have problems at the neuromuscular junction. So to do this, I'm gonna highlight two things that we already talked about. In orange, you see acetylcholine that gets released from the presynaptic nerve terminal. On the end plate there, you see the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. On the postsynaptic membrane, this is where the acetylcholine binds to, and under normal circumstances, you'll have a properly generated action potential. What you see at the top there in blue is a calcium channel, and we haven't talked about this yet, so let's just briefly go over this. 
Calcium channels allow calcium to flow into the presynaptic nerve terminal, and calcium is really, really important for the release of vesicles in which neurotransmitters are stored. So not just acetylcholine, but every neurotransmitter, right, like dopamine, norepinephrine, etc., they all require calcium to allow the vesicles in which those neurotransmitters are stored to dump the neurotransmitters in the nerve junction. So calcium must be in the presynaptic nerve terminal. And in other words, we need calcium to flow from the outside into that presynaptic area where the acetylcholine will be stored. So that's why the calcium channel is very important. There are three disease processes that you should know that can occur when any one of these three processes get messed up. So I'm gonna use the color coding to make this really simple. We have Lambert-Eaton syndrome, botulism, and myasthenia gravis. Lambert-Eaton syndrome corresponds to the calcium channel, botulism to acetylcholine release, and myasthenia gravis to the postsynaptic nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. So let's talk about the differences here, and this is how we'll wrap up. Lambert-Eaton syndrome is due to the destruction of the presynaptic calcium channels. Botulism occurs when you have problems due to acetylcholine release. Myasthenia gravis occurs when you have immune attack against the postsynaptic nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So let's pause for one second here. The first thing I want to point out is the difference between Lambert-Eaton and myasthenia gravis, because these can sound similar on tests. When they go after this, they like to go after the mechanism here. So know that Lambert-Eaton syndrome is presynaptic, and it's the calcium channel. Know that myasthenia gravis is postsynaptic, and it's the nic nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Big difference there, pre versus postsynaptic. Um, Lambert-Eaton syndrome and myasthenia gravis are both type 2 hypersensitivity reactions. Just good to keep in the back of your mind. Botulism is caused by a heat label enterotoxin. Now, perhaps the highest yield thing on this slide are the associations. So know that Lambert-Eaton syndrome is associated with small cell lung cancer. Know that botulism is associated with... Um, eating honey, and know that myasthenia gravis is associated with a thymoma. If they give you a thymoma, they want myasthenia gravis. If they give you Lambert-Eaton syndrome, they're going to say, what should you do? You know, maybe a lung x-ray or CT, whatever, because you want to think about the small cell lung cancer. They're going to talk about honey. <laughs> they're going for botulism. So mechanism, association, and pre- or postsynaptic are very important with these disease processes. Now, I'm not going to go through the symptoms individually. Obviously, we're talking about the neuromuscular junction, so there's going to be problems with things like being super, you know, flax. Um, so there's going to be problems with coordination of proper muscular contraction. So you can be contracted too much. You can be way too lax, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, review the symptoms on your own time. I'm here to give you the high yields, the associations, what you need to think about on test day. But that's it, guys. That's the neuromuscular junction. That's neuromuscular blockade. That's depolarizing versus non-depolarizing neuromuscular blockers. Remember, the depolarizing agent sucks. And the non-depolarizing agents, ND curium. The curious ND agents that don't do anything. That is neuromuscular blockade.